Do you know it's morning? I've just been told you've been working, uh, what, 48 hours or more? Okay, so night and day might be a bit of a problem to distinguish. Anyway, uh, thank you, uh, WSO2, for inviting me here. Uh, distinct honor and privilege. And uh, great to share a few thoughts uh, with all of you. Um, if you can keep awake for the next 20 minutes or so. And uh, please also make it interactive. Happy to answer any questions, um, share any views, enter into any arguments that you might have. Uh, even customer service issues, I can spare some extra time on that since it's a Sunday. Um, OK, so I was asked to share, or rather go back 20 plus years um, to when I chose to be in the mobile industry. Uh, why? How has it been? Um, how can some of that experience be of some value uh, to uh, those starting off a new career or already in a career but looking to broaden or invigorate their careers in ICT? So 20 years ago, um, I was actually uh, working at IBM after doing my first degree in uh, electronics. Uh, I came back to Sri Lanka and then I was an electronic engineer, but I chose to do marketing. And uh, I became what was actually a glorified sales representative at IBM, just called systems engineer. But what it was, was to work with technology and look at how technology could be adapted in a Sri Lankan context to add value to Sri Lankan businesses. Um, coming from uh, electronic engineering, highly bits and bytes, and in those days, transistors and amplifiers background, uh, to go straight in front of the customer and for the first time be shown machines uh, which had big doors on them, the AS400s, the System 36 was just going out at the time, but the AS400 was, and of course some of the Unix machines were coming in, even with IBM, and uh, not being allowed to touch anything. Right? It gave me the sense that, or, the, or brought me down to earth, that the only value in technology was if it adds value to somebody. It's just a black box, not allowed to go and play around with the chips or take them out or reprogram them. Here is an IBM AS400. Go make it work for somebody. Um, I did that for two years and uh, happened to get uh, a scholarship to go back to the UK to do my PhD. So at that time, I had the opportunity to decide what I wanted to do. So normal PhD uh, uh, sort of suspect list, ranging from robotics to artificial intelligence to all kinds of very high-flown stuff. Telecommunications sounded a bit boring, um, so on. And I made my decision uh, based on one uh, dimension which was very, very personal, which was that I wanted to come back to Sri Lanka and I wanted to be relevant to Sri Lanka. So out went all the high-flown ones, like robotics. I knew if I did robotics or artificial intelligence, I'd come back here, I would last a week or two. It wouldn't, give, it wouldn't fulfill me, obviously, uh, and I would drift off again and get lost somewhere. So I chose telecommunications. And out of the telecommunication sphere, I also felt, just looking around, I spent a couple of weeks just looking at my customers. To begin with, I was, a, like I said, I was a marketeer. And also the general citizenry of our country. And I tried to identify some sphere which I felt that in four years' time would really make a difference to Sri Lanka and also be something that everybody could use and something which could also justify the introduction of the latest technologies, which I would get to play with, obviously, if I'm doing a PhD, um, justify the adoption of latest technology and make productive use of it. And I zeroed in on mobile communication. 
And that is what I did my PhD in. So I went out, I did my PhD in uh, uh, what was called DSCDMA, direct sequence CDMA, uh, which is CDMA stands for code division multiple access. Right? Uh, not sure how many, of, how many of you are familiar with CDMA, how it works, codes, yeah, scrambling. Uh, scrambling and descrambling, basically. Very clever technology, um, which was incidentally uh, used by the US way back in the 40s for warfare. Right? And it was then hidden away in the archives. Nobody touched it till it came out in the late, in the mid 80s, when the archives were opened and all the uh, scrambling algorithms came out and then a CDMA was born. So I did my PhD studying the design of a base station or trying to create a base station algorithm to separate mobile conversations uh, in a very interference limited environment. Finished my PhD and I was very, very lucky that Dialog was just starting off at that time. So I was the third employee uh, of Dialog and uh, it was a tough choice uh, because you know, I had uh, other opportunities to work directly in uh, advancing the same technologies in the US and in England. And here was a completely different opportunity where it was a desk and three chairs to build Sri Lanka's first digital network. And that's how it started and the rest is, of course, uh, history. Now, that may not be a very interesting story other than for the fact that in your careers, I think I would say peg your personal orientation first. There's nothing right or wrong, right? Some would like to come back to Sri Lanka. Some would like to spend the next 10 years. But there's something in you which is deep-seated in your heart, which is something very personal. Ask yourself that question and answer it precisely. And don't let that go. Make that the fundamental. Why should that be the fundamental? That should be the fundamental because if you're not happy in what you're doing, you won't perform to the best of your ability. So in my case, that fundamental was I want to make this country my home and I want to contribute back. Uh, and I wanted to build my career in a way that it would not be irrelevant for Sri Lanka. That was my personal decision. And there's nothing in wrong in making a completely different one. But my point is, make that personal decision. And be aware of it. Aware of what's burning inside you. And not necessarily what somebody else is telling you you should be doing. Or looking across the table or looking over your shoulder and wondering why am I not doing as well as him or her. That's not important. So first, let that define and uh, uh, anchor yourself on your personal fire inside you. Then you'll do your best. Right? It can be the craziest thing, but you will do your best. And if you're doing your best, you'll deliver to the maximum. And that would be the best that you can do for everybody, including yourself. So that's the only lesson I take from that whole long story. The next is, of course, to be a little cognizant of how the world around you is changing. Uh, try to project how things would move, how things would change. And that is also something I did to uh, be able to forecast, fortunately it worked, uh, forecast that four years from 1991, when, it's, when I got on a plane and went to do my PhD, that four years from then, that mobile communications, and for that matter, digital mobile communications would be relevant and something that Sri Lanka would benefit from, right? Uh, so it's good to always be aware and project into the future. Then, uh, starting dialogue, uh, I joined as an engineer, um, did what I liked, I did my best. I had absolutely, absolutely no intention of being a CEO. Right, I had never benchmarked myself in any way to be a CEO. So I was an engineering manager uh, setting up the network. There were a few expat advisors um, on the 
building of that of the first uh, phase of the network. I became the CTO in '96, and all I can say is that I just enjoyed what I was doing, and I did my best. I just worked hard. I enjoyed what I did, and I put all my effort into it. That's all. '97, uh, towards the end of '97, my boss at the time, who was the CEO, he um, got another assignment, and uh, he said, one day he just took me out for dinner, and he said. I need to go. Uh, I got another assignment. Uh, so I said, OK, uh, that's sad. Um, you know, do you really need to go? Can't you stay another six months? You know, help, help us get past this uh, first phase of development, et cetera, et cetera. And the next question just threw me. Because he just said, can you take over the company? Uh, that time I was 29. Um, it came as a shock. But what really shocked me was that I answered in one breath, yes, that I can do it. And uh, then I took over as CEO. Um, then came the serious stuff, right? No more engineer, uh, no more making mistakes, all the responsibilities of HR, uh, of finance, of having to watch a bottom line. And it was quite a bit of a shock. But it was, to me, another engineering problem. So I sat down and I drew block diagrams. How do companies work? Right? I took a PNL. I had done a little bit of finance, but uh, I took a PNL and I just built it up like a block diagram. It's a control system. Right? Uh, I put a management system around it, feedback loops, uh, control loops, uh, error detection. I'm sure you're using completely different words today, right? But this is old engineering stuff. Dilendra and I probably <laughs> can relate to these words, but sorry if I'm talking a different language. Um, and I started enjoying this. And what I enjoyed the most was the people. And today, you know, many, many, you know, 17 years later, um, and right along the way, many people have, you know, said, you know, great, you've built a market leader. And I always say, uh, with from my heart, I can say that it's not any special capability or any special brilliance or anything of mine which built the company. But I do take one aspect of that build uh, to be mine, and that is that I have chose the right people. I chose the right people from the day go. The first thing I did the first month or so, I uh, concentrated on the characteristics of the people I want. And in doing this, uh, I used the model of a rugby team. Because rugby was a sport that I really enjoyed. I did play when, at St. Thomas's when in, at the junior level, but I never had the opportunity to follow that dream to play at a senior level. But nevertheless, I used to marvel at the game and its science. So I applied this rugby team model to choosing and building a management team. And if you think about it, in a rugby team, what you have is diversity. Right? If you have 15 burly, slow elephants, you won't have a rugby team. Right? But you do need, I would say, around six very burly, unmovable, powerhouses. But you also need those risk takers. You also need the quick thinkers. You need the playmakers. You need the strong defense. You need those who are willing to do just one job well, time and time again, like a scrum half. Right? It's almost the same job the scrum half does all the time. You need a coach. You need the bench. You need the backup. And it's the coordinated effort of this diversity, different skills, different talents, different orientations, different characters that make a strong management team. A management team who can see opportunities and dash for it, at the same time push with stealth and with determination forward slowly. 
But if you see an opportunity, be fast, grab it. Right? If you make a mistake, it's no problem because you have your defense and you must never be afraid of making mistakes. Now that is what you call a DNA in a company. And in today's world, uh, in the uh, software-driven, very exciting world that all of you are going into, you might see an abundance of that adventure. But you might not see a sufficient background, a sufficient foundation of resilience. And that is something to be aware of, just looking outside in. I can see many aspects of this new world which we never enjoyed and we didn't have the wisdom to introduce. Open development, for example, letting people just run amok on your systems, right? I'm not say, using the word amok in a negative sense. It's, it's actually create, creation, right? You, it's open and it's free. And those were concepts that we unfortunately didn't embrace in our times. I'm beginning to embrace now, and uh, I think we're learning from all of you. But what you need to be aware is in the real world, and especially in environments such as ours, in the developing world, that there isn't enough money and there isn't enough space to make too many mistakes. Right? If you look at the entrepreneurship environment and the, um, all the startup environments in the world, I'm sure Prajit talked to you yesterday. In the developed world, where there's a lot of money, you can afford to lose nine out of 10 or even more. Right? You try, you fail. You don't need to be resilient. You don't need the strong foundations of business realities. Because you can try, somebody buys you, it's a lot of dollars swimming around, you might make it, you might fail, you try again. It looks almost an open field and an open environment for success. But as you come back to the tighter economies, like in our region, then you might find that there isn't that much space for mistakes. There isn't that much appetite for failure. So be aware of that. And all I would say is to add a tinge of management, add a tinge of finance to your skill set. And that might make you far, far stronger than your global competition as individuals or as teams or as companies. Because even the US, even the richest countries in this world will go through recession at some point. The cycles come and go. Silicon Valley is not going to be as dynamic and affluent as it is today always. Let's hope it is, but I don't think so. So having a mix of innovation and having sound foundations in what actually pays for innovation, which is resilience in tough times, resilience against competition, basically building businesses. So what I would recommend to you from my own experience was that if I hadn't spent some time way back then studying the fundamentals of business, of economics, understanding what makes the world go round. I may not have survived, or at least I may not have been able to drive the speed of adoption and the speed of development that we were fortunate to do. Now, going, staying a little bit longer on uh, the developing world, I think you, you would be very, very knowledgeable about uh, business or rather software and what software does for people, the, the new concepts that can be driven to valuations and so on. I think you all know uh, about that. But maybe I can share a little bit about 
what is the relevance of technology in, say, Sri Lanka, in the emerging markets. One paradigm which I have followed throughout, right from day one, is that technology is for everyone. And that is a piece of reality which I think companies like WSO2, uh, developers like all of you, strongly believe in. Technology is not proprietary. Technology is best used when it's shared. And technology is most powerful when it is available to everyone. Now, that wasn't that apparent way back 20 years ago. You would, those of you, no, I'm sure none of you were around in, a, uh, around in the sense that you would not have seen those early um, mobile phones, right? the, what they call the Gadol Bhagir, in uh, the late, I would say, mid-80s. Right? They cost 125,000 rupees. They were a status symbol. Uh, a call cost 25 rupees a minute. I mean, having a mobile phone was like owning a Mercedes. So the concept there is it was an exclusive product. And I believe that technology is not exclusive. It is inherently inclusive. And that's the first decision we took. And that's how dialogue broke through the market and became a market leader in three years. We were the last entrant to the market in 1997. By 2000, we were market leader, not because of GSM, not because of technology. It was purely because our business orientation was we want technology to be inclusive. What is inclusive? Make your products available and affordable to as many people as possible. So you structure your business in a completely different way. Because what you do is you look at the opportunity. How many people, 20 million people, right? would they like to have a mobile phone? Yes. Right? We did research. We spoke to students. We spoke to people on the street, tri shot drivers. This was way back in 1997. Soldiers, construction workers, fishermen, CEOs, we all ask them, you know, we ask them all, would you like a mobile phone? If you don't know the price of this thing, would you like it? Would you like to take the phone and speak to somebody? They all said yes. Size of opportunity, right? huge. Then the problem was just to make this product affordable, relevant, available, applicable to these people. Now, someone who designs an exclusive business plan would look at it the other way around. They would look at, here's the cost of my device. Let's look around and see how many people can afford this. And what is the maximum margin I can put on top of this to make the most amount of money? That is called an exclusive business plan, exclusive orientation. So the person designing an exclusive business would have seen a market of maybe 20,000 people at maximum. The person designing an inclusive business plan saw 1 million, 10 million, 20 million. So it's a shoe, the famous shoe salesman story. So these stories are, I guess, elementary. How many of you have heard the shoe salesman story? One, two, worth sharing it? Yeah? The shoe salesman story is that there was this island, um, and this shoe manufacturer sent their salesman out, a salesman out, or two salesmen, sorry, I'm getting the story wrong, to this island. And one guy wrote back saying, get me the next flight. Nobody wears shoes here. The other guy said, send me a container of shoes. Nobody has wears shoes here. Right? It's just how you see the same problem. So when innovating, at whatever level you're innovating, whether it's software or building a new business or you're being an entrepreneur, I would strongly recommend to remember that this world is about sharing and that if you have a choice between an inclusive orientation to what you're doing and an exclusive one, 
always look at how can I make this relevant and applicable to as many people as possible. That is the business model that will work. And that is, I think, if you talk about WSO2 in Sri Lanka and the uh, open source vision that Sanjeev has driven for many years, even globally. Um, in a software domain, I think I, I don't know much about uh, software uh, domain, really. But I would say that from glancing from outside, it seems that that is the thinking. That innovation, if shared, if populated, and people allowed to pool in, uh, then that it would drive further innovation and also drive business and wealth in a way which an exclusive model will not. And I think it's left to be seen whether the oracles of this world, uh, the IBMs of this world will, unless they adopt the same inclusive approach, whether they would survive 10 years or 20 years from today. So in the dialogue story, actually going back to that same period, we wrote down on the board our hypothesis that unless we made our business inclusive, that we would not survive. And that, I think, was the one correct decision that we took and which drove dialogue in this market. And following from that, there were many decisions we took. Because once you think that way, and when you see a person on the road, you ask yourself, why isn't that person using a mobile phone? Now everybody uses a mobile phone. Why isn't that guy using data? And we'll solve that problem. Why isn't that guy using his phone to pay? We'll solve that problem. But the vision is to get everybody to do it. Not to hold it and not to preserve it in an environment where you can drive larger and bigger margins. And that is the dynamism, I think, which needs to redefine all of us. Because if you look around you, you'll see that our consumers, right? your consumers may be an end user of your innovations. Our, our end users are pretty clear. And ask yourselves, what am I really doing? What is my output? What business am I in? Again, something which I've repeated many, many times, both at Dialogue and wherever I speak, I just, again, draw on this very interesting story which I picked up from my MBA studies uh, many years ago. And that is the Parker Penn story. Parker in the US, right? You can think of Parker today and just think of some of the legacy software companies, legacy technology companies. It was still big, right? And Parker went down for many, uh, for two, three years in a row. They fired the CEO and a new CEO comes in, and he came in from a different industry. So he brought all his regional directors and so on together, and he asked them, you know, I'm, I'm new. I'm new to this industry. I want to start you know, running from tomorrow. Could you please tell me what business we are in? Right, it's like if any of you join Dialogue tomorrow. Nobody from Dialogue here? No, sad. Let's say you join Dialogue tomorrow, and uh, you're working at Dialogue. Somebody comes and asks you, and the, the CEO for that matter comes and asks you, what business are we in? Question which is very fundamental. So everyone there had apparently been given a piece of paper, a post-it or whatever, and they wrote on it, we are in the business of making pens. Uh, we are in the business of making writing instruments high quality writing instruments, exclusive writing instruments, valuable writing instruments, valuable pens, uh, beautiful pens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And apparently one person got it right. He wrote down, we are in the business of making gifts. Now, when that answer came in, and the story goes it was only one out of the whole room, that redefined Parker. Because they had not listened to their consumers. They had not looked out and really checked out whether people buy Parker because they want a pen 
or whether people buy Parker or any pen, expensive pen for that matter, because they are buying a gift. So just work through that example. If, how many times do you buy an expensive pen? Almost never, right? You might get one, or even if you do buy one, you'll buy one again only if you lose it. You don't buy an expensive pen, pen that often. So how big is that market? People who can afford an expensive pen in the first place, and multiplied by the frequency at which you would buy yourself an expensive pen. Very small market, very low growth, right? Unless people become very, very rich. On the other hand, how many times does that affordable segment buy a gift? They would buy a gift 10 times a year, 20 times a year, birthdays, presents, corporate gifts, etc. So what happened there was the market, simply by looking at what you're doing differently, the market expanded many fold. However, at the same time, the competition that you had to face also increased many fold. Because now competition included not just Sheffer and Waterman and other pens, but neckties and cufflinks and perfumes and any other sort of gift. So that's where these marketeers come into play, right? They are useful, believe me. Marketeers can transform that business proposition from where it was yesterday in terms of what it offers our customers to what it should be. And then the story goes that Parker then changed every single business process, every, the way they work top to bottom to make their business a gift business. Yes, in pens, but in gifts. So why did I tell you this story? Because it's also relevant at an individual level. It's certainly relevant at a business level. When times are dynamic and times are changing, you need to answer this question every three months or every six months. That's something we do. But at an individual level also, you need to really think, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? What is the value I'm delivering and to whom? And that can also help shape careers. So why I shared a little bit of experience from uh, some of my personal background, uh, some experiences, lessons learned building a technology business in this country may not be that relevant if you think of a foreign land, but I think some of it would remain equally applicable. Wherever you go, think of the community, people who will eventually pay your salary, who will buy your company, who will pay for your innovation. There is no free lunch and there is no value creation out of nothing. In physics, there is the famous Shannon's law. How many know about Shannon's law? No? Doesn't give you your age away if you answer it correctly. No? Okay. So it's basically that in, in, our, in our business, in spectrum or in energy, uh, you have so many megahertz of spectrum, for example, that by putting X amount of power or kilowatt power into that spectrum, you can transmit fundamentally only a certain bandwidth. You can cut it, chop it, use CDMA, FDMA, TDMA, whatever method, or you can use whatever modulation techniques or scrambling techniques, but end of the day, there's a fundamental physical law which limits the amount of throughput you can have. So even in, even in the commercial world, this reality hits at some point where there's a fundamental limit to wealth. And if you want to get an above average return out of that fundamentally limited pool of wealth, 
whether it be through entrepreneurship, whether it be through working for a company, whether it be through being a startup wizard, it will not harm you to have a very close eye on what's going around, the people around you, the problems you are solving. Because if the problem you're solving is not relevant to the people, eventually somebody will stop paying for it. And that business will not be sustainable. So that's a little bit of boring stuff. Uh, I know IT is far more exciting. Development is far more exciting than assessing risks or looking behind the curtains to who's paying money for it. But I thought I'll share that because if you're looking at not one year or two years, but 10, 20, 30 years career and you have the aspirations as you should to be the best in the world, and I wish you all the best to get there, then always good to look around you. Look at people, look at communities, look at societies, and look at what problem you can solve for them. And that somebody will pay for someday. Right? So happy to take any questions. Uh, hope I didn't bore you too much. I just shared some thoughts which have helped me uh, reflect from time to time, what am I doing? Anything? Uh, anything that you like me to share? No? To wake them up. <laughs> yes? Okay, so question was uh, that Parker, Parker chose that they are in, the ma in making gifts, what is uh, Dialogue's business? It has changed by answering this question. And at this point, um, we believe we are in the business of empowerment, digital empowerment. Um, that's, what does that mean? It means that by placing this mobile phone or any of our other digital products in the palm of your hand or in your home, that you will have more self-empowerment today than tomorrow. And that is what people are buying. People are buying power. In a very advanced market like the US, people are buying fun. By people are buying entertainment because they already are empowered. They are in a highly developed economy, right? In, in our parts of the world, people, majority of people buy our services because they want to be more empowered tomorrow. In the US, they might be buying it because they want to play with more apps. They will want to you know, read the magazines and watch movies and stuff like that. But here, a majority, majority of consumers would buy it to make their lives better tomorrow. So if that is our business, then all our innovation has to be around A, making this affordable to as many people as possible, but B, also enabling people to make their lives better, uh, do business better, uh, save some money, uh, learn something so that the kids can uh, have equal access to education, for example. That is what people are buying, in our view. I might be wrong. <laughs> 